Hey, hey, I'm Keith from Keith Johnson Custom Woodworking, and today I'm gonna show you how to assemble, set up, and use this Woodpecker's Slab Flattening Mill Pro to flatten things like this beautiful cherry slab. Stick around. So the first thing we want to assemble are the two sets of guide blocks. We have two short guide blocks and two long guide blocks. The short guide blocks will be mounted to the router carriage, and the two long guide blocks will be part of the cross rail assembly. Now I've assembled one of each so far, and now I'll show you how I did it on the remaining two. The first thing we want to do is adhere the UHMW tape, ultra high molecular weight tape. This is going to provide a virtually frictionless surface as we move the router carriage up and down the guide rails. The short guide block gets four two inch strips, two on each end, and the long guide block gets four four inch strips, two on each end. Now the key here is to align the edge of the UHMW tape with the edge of this groove on the guide block. Make sure you burnish it and press down firmly to get good adhesion. Next up we want to install the safety stop in the middle of the long guide block. To do that we'll take two button head hex screws, insert them through the back of the safety stop, and then take two quarter twenty nylock nuts, loosely fit those on there, and then in this back track, you can slide this over, and get it roughly in the middle, like so. Next we can take two button head screws and two nylock nuts, and loosely install these into the smaller flange of the guide rail gusset. Then two of the one inch button head screws and two of the oval nuts. Again, just loosely installed. Now we can slide each of these flange assemblies into the long guide block. And we have two of these one and a half inch button head screws. We're going to insert up through the bottom and attach a nylon nut onto each one of those. We also have two end caps and install with these Torx screws. It is highly advised you do not use a drill for this. Just tighten them by hand with the supplied Torx bit. We'll push these flanges to the end and line up the end of the flange with the end cap. Now we don't want to fully tighten these at this time. Just get them a little snug. And if you have a T-handle Allen wrench, that would come in really handy at this point. Now with the Slab Flattener Pro, you get two sets of guide rails. Two long rails, 76 inch, and two shorter rails, 59 inch. The two 59 inch rails are what we're going to use to attach the guide rail assemblies that we just put together. Now it is recommended that you do this on a flat level surface. I've put a piece of plywood down on the bench here to give me a nice flat working surface. So now we can continue with assembly. Now it's just a matter of attaching the cross rail guide assembly to the V rail. And to do that, I recommend putting this end of the V guide rail on top of the other guide rail assembly just to prop it up. Or you can place two blocks of wood under here. That way it's much easier to align this and get that in that bottom slot. I'll do the same thing with the other side. So before these two screws under here are tightened all the way, we're going to slide this back. Before we officially secure the V rail to the cross rail, they need to be square to one another. For that, I prefer the 1281, but the problem is trying to access this bolt underneath with the Allen wrench is very difficult. And we also need to keep in mind that this end mounting flange goes on here and needs to be flush with the end. So what I've found the easiest thing to do is to tip this upright. And since this is still loose, we can move this up, slide this underneath on both sides. Now by putting our square firmly in place against our work surface, and our V-rail, we can secure these last screws. And the last one underneath. Then we can move over to the opposite side and do the same thing. 
Now I can tip this back down and install these end flanges. At this point we can attach the end caps to both of our long V-rails using three torque screws in each one. Now since my bench here isn't wide enough to accommodate the 59 inch V-rails, when I square up and tighten down this cross rail guide, I'm going to bring it in so that it does work with the width of my bench. That's just another point of versatility with this jig is it can accommodate any width bench that you have. So I'm going to slide this in about right there. I'm going to tip this up using my square. With this actually flipped over, this kind of works a little bit better. Now we can set this entire assembly on top of our V-rails. Once we get them spaced out properly, like that. And you can see how this starts to come together. So next we can affix one of the long V-rails to the bench and the second one we need to make sure it's perfectly parallel with that as well as the same distance on each end so that there's no binding as the carriage moves back and forth. This is where a perfectly flat work surface is essential. Once these V-rails are secured to the work surface, you don't want them bowed in any direction. That could telescope to your workpiece as you run the router across, and then you won't end up with a flat milled surface, which is the ultimate goal with this jig. Now I can tell by looking at my V-rails to my bench, there's a little gap under here on both sides, which means the workbench has a little bit of a dip in the middle. So what I'm going to have to do is put some shims under there to make sure those stay perfectly level and there's no flex and also make sure that they're perfectly level top to top with one another. A couple shims and we should be fine and we can secure these down to the workbench. Now to get our rails set up to our workbench, I'm going to screw down one side. We can move down the other end and attach that. I mentioned earlier there was a little bit of a belly in this bench, so what I've done is I've cut some small shims and wedged those in there, so now there's no flex in this V-rail and it is perfectly flat. I've checked it with a level, so now I'm going to do the same thing to the other side and make sure these rails are parallel and equidistant apart the entire way down, and I'll have to shim up that side as well to make sure that there's no flex. The great thing about these mounting flanges is they have slotted holes, so if you mount it and you find you need to move one in or out, you can just loosen the screw slightly, slide it over, and tighten it back down. Now that I have the rail shimmed so it's perfectly flat all the way across, I'm going to slide in one of these mounting flanges. I'm going to have to shim this a little bit. This is going to secure the middle of the rail to make sure it doesn't deflect in any direction as we're moving across and up and down with our routing operations. Now with our V-rails attached to the bench and coplanar, we can move our guide rail assembly in place. Next up is to assemble the carriage that will house the router and the dust collection system. I'm gonna save you the agony of me putting in all these screws all the way around and just show you how I install the last part of the dust curtain now, in order to assemble this and for future use of storing the carriage, you want to build a box that looks like this. Now, the instructions have exact dimensions. I just happen to have this one around the shop that fits perfectly. It's a little higher than the one spec'd in the manual, but it works just fine. So with this on here, I can take the last piece of dust curtain with the last flange and using the supplied screws, secure this to the carriage. What I've also done here with these two and a half inch dust ports before I secured them down, was put a layer of silicone under each one. That way when these tighten down, we get a nice tight seal and there's no air leakage when the dust collection is on. You could also put a gasket of some kind under here Either way, I just highly recommend one of those two options so you don't lose any airflow. For the next part of the assembly, we're going to use the two short guide blocks 
that back at the beginning, we put these UHMW strips on, and we're also gonna take these two router carriage hangers. Each one of these has the bolt already installed. So we're gonna insert that into the holes on the side. We have two nylon washers and two red knobs. Secure those. Next, we're gonna take each of the short guide blocks Put one on the side and then two button head hex knobs using the second hole in from the end. Now we can move this over to our guide rail assembly. We place the carriage on the V-rails. We want to move it all the way down until it comes in contact with the cross rail assembly. And then making sure everything is seated nice and flat both ends, we can tighten these four bolts. Now I can slide it down to the other end. Double check everything again. That's nice. It's moving freely. Ready to move on to the next step. Now I can get these end caps installed. Now I did jump ahead earlier with these dust collection ports because I wanted to make sure that silicone had time to dry before we worked on the rest of it. So the final steps of this are to attach these two cross braces, each with these red wing knobs. And you want to situate these hose clamps so you have access to the screws. The last thing to do is put these two handles, one on each side. To do that, we're gonna use a bolt, comes up through the bottom, and this black nylon washer. I'm gonna turn this around. When we first assembled this router carriage, we had it set in the highest slots possible which actually puts it at its lowest point. Ideally, I think this should be done the opposite way and placed in the lowest slot, which puts it the highest point up away from the slab, and then we can adjust and lower it down from there. You can see on the bottom here, there's a bunch of different holes pre-drilled in the carriage. These will correspond to different routers that you may have that you can mount to this. By looking at the instruction manual, it tells you which router which hole location and which screws to use. Now for our purposes today, we're gonna to be using the Festool 2200. So you can see from this list, the Festool 2200, hole location four, which is here and here. And you have an M6 bolt and there's two of them. So this is what we're gonna to use to attach it. So I've found the best way to do this, at least for this router, is tip it up on end, take the carriage, and slide it over the top. Make sure those are nice and snug. We're gonna be flattening this cherry slab, which has quite a cup in it today. You can see that. So what we're gonna to wanna to do is shim this to make sure it's not rocking in any direction, that it's nice and solid. And then we're gonna use these slab clamping dogs to bite into the material and screw down into our work surface to make sure it doesn't move. So now I just want to shim this so it's nice and stable. It's a very important part of the process. You don't want this thing rocking at all as you're going across, otherwise it won't be flat when you're done. We can attach these pinch dogs. When attaching these, we also want to make sure they're well below the top surface of the slab so there's no chance of the router bit ever coming into contact with them. Now we can place our guide rail assembly back on our V-rails. And as you can see, where I have the overhang of the V-rails, I have that on the opposite side of me. That way they don't come into contact with me at all as I'm moving this back and forth. Another option, if it needs to be shorter like it does in this application, what you can do is offset these rails. So this one would overhang this side, this one would overhang that side. That way you can approach it from either side 
and these won't interfere with you. You won't be locked in the middle of two of them. So now I can place the router carriage assembly on top. And since you want this curtain to just kind of come in contact with the slab like that, this is our high point. So we're actually at a perfect height with our carriage assembly. Now there's gonna be gaps all the way around the sides and the back, but that's because our slab is cupped. As we continually make passes down, this will even out. And by the looks of it, as we make a few passes and get past this high point, this whole carriage assembly will have to be moved down so that our dust shroud comes in contact all the way around with our slab. That will give us the best possible dust collection. Another option to avoid that would be to find your high spot, hit that with a hand plane first, and then you can adjust your carriage down. But for this application, I'll show you how it's done this way. Now for visibility purposes, I've taped up part of the vinyl curtain so you can see underneath and see the bit as it comes in contact with the slab. So I'm gonna move this until I hit exactly where I need to be, which is right there. That is ground zero with the slab. So I wanna go a little bit lower. I'm gonna set this to about an eighth of an inch depth and then make a couple passes and lower it again, make a couple passes, and then possibly at that point reset the height of the router carriage. I'm using a white side 6220 spoil board surfacing bit, but as you can see, I'm getting quite a bit of burning. This bit is rather dull and I swapped it out for a new one and you'll see I'll get much better results as we move on. All right, so I vacuumed up all the dust that we had going everywhere, and now we can take our carriage and adjust the height so that our vinyl curtain comes in contact with our work surface, which is gonna give us much better dust collection as we continue down and flatten the rest of this slab. Having these index grooves and holes makes it very easy to adjust the height. Do the same thing for the other side. After this, we shouldn't have to adjust this again. We can just adjust the height of our bit in our router. So if you're dealing with a relatively flat slab, you won't have to do this at all. But since this one was twisted and cupped so much, we needed to make a couple adjustments as we go. So now that vinyl curtain come into contact with the workpiece, we should be able to flatten with maximum dust collection. So as you can see, the dust collection is much better. We obviously have a little bit here and there, but it was nothing like before where our dust shroud wasn't in contact with the workpiece. So I'm going to continue on flattening this and we'll see at the end how much dust we have left and see the finished surface that it leaves. All right, so now we have a nice flat cherry slab on one side. Now, there's obviously still some dust everywhere around here. It's, it's impossible to avoid that even with the dust collection system, because as the carriage goes over one edge, it's exposed under here and you're not getting as much suction. So you lose some there. And as you come back across this side, the same thing happens. However, the dust collection is vastly improved from where we were when we started, when the vinyl dust shroud wasn't in contact with the work surface. So I'm gonna finish cleaning the area and then I'll come back with some final thoughts on the Woodpeckers Slab Flattening Mill Pro. So as you can see, once this was all set up, it was a breeze to flatten this cherry slab. In an ideal situation, you'd be able to leave this set up in your shop and every time you had a slab, you could bring it over, shim it up, screw it down, flatten it, so on and so on. If you don't have that luxury, storage is still not that big of an issue. You have the carriage which you can store, the guide rail assembly here, I have it hanging on the wall, and then these two V-rails I have up in my lumber rack. So when I need to flatten something, 
bring everything back down, screw it to the table, and I'm ready to go. So one of the big advantages of the Slab Flattening Mill Pro is being able to flatten large slabs up to 11 feet long with the extension kit and up to almost four feet wide. Now if purchasing the 76 inch extension kit wasn't enough, you could purchase a second and make this even longer. Now when you compare the dust collection on this compared to the original slab flattener, it is vastly improved. Now obviously there's still gonna be some dust when you're going on each edge of your slab where there isn't full enclosure of the dust shroud and you lose suction, but it still seemed to be contained pretty well within the two rails. It's also dependent on how powerful your dust collection is. The dust collector in here is quite a distance away, so I'm losing a little bit of suction, but it's still quite tolerable and easy to clean up. It's extremely versatile in the size that it can go up to, so you're really only limited by your work surface that you have in your shop. Another great advantage of the Slab Flattening Mill Pro is being able to edge joint and do rabbiting operations. Because trying to edge joint a 10 foot by three foot by two inch thick slab on your joiner would be quite difficult. But with a straight bit and using the lockdown tabs, you can easily go up and down and edge joint your workpiece. That becomes extremely valuable on large heavy pieces. So if you're someone who processes a lot of large slabs or tabletops, the Woodpecker Slab Flattening Mill Pro might be just what you need to improve your efficiency and productivity.